Restart by Gordon Corman. Chapter 12. Chase Ambrose. A few more memories have come back. Mostly, it's just images and impressions, but there's one that's pretty concrete. My mother has been showing me a lot of old pictures in the hope that something might ring a bell. One snapshot of an ivy-covered building looks kind of familiar. The student union at Johnny's University, Mom explains. It triggers a flashback. It's not that I remember it. It's more like it's already in my head and I'm just noticing it now. Mom and seventh grade Chase are dropping Johnny off at college. Our car pulls around a long circular drive in front of the building in the photograph. Johnny gets out. It's his first day of freshman year, his first time living away from home. He seems terrified. And what do I feel? Sympathy for my poor scared brother? Or for mom who's on the verge of tears? For myself even? I'll be losing my brother to a new life in a faraway place. I don't feel any of those things. Instead, I'm thinking, what a wuss this kid is. I can't believe I ever looked up to him. What a wimp. What a baby. My scorn is so sharp that it jolts me back to the here and now. How could I have made such harsh judgments about my own brother? When I was in the hospital, Johnny was there at my bedside every minute mom was, just as worried about me, just as torn up by my accident. I guess that wasn't payback for the wonderful brotherly loyalty I've shown him over the years. People say I've changed. I'm barely beginning to understand how much. Dr. Cooperman isn't surprised that my memory is returning. My brain is totally fine, he says at my next appointment. After all, I remember everything that's happened since coming out of the coma. Not that it would be easy to forget things like Shoshana dumping frozen yogurt on my head, or Brendan going through the car wash on a tricycle, or how it felt to push Joey against the wall. A blur of violence, anger, and lightning fast action. And something else, too. I may not be proud of it, but it's the truth. Satisfaction. I didn't like the way a situation was going, and I ch changed it with my own physical power. Aaron's words come back to me. You didn't have to attack him. And Shoshana's. Goon. That haunts me a little. I don't regret stopping Joey from bullying Brendan. But was fighting really the only way to make that happen? Worse, I didn't even consider trying to talk Joey down. I just grabbed the kid and manhandled him, the same way he was manhandling Brendan. I get that the old Chase could be like that, before the accident. But now I'm starting to wonder if that person is still inside me, emerging from the darkness bit by bit along with my memory. As weird as it was to lose my past, this might even be weirder. The more that comes back, the less I recognize myself. Dr. Cooperman also pronounces me fully recovered physically. Then he drops the bomb. He still wants me off football for the rest of the season. I must seem pretty devastated because he adds, it's all out, it's all out of an abundance of caution, but you're fine. But concussions can't be taken lightly. We're learning new things about the long-term effects every day. I know you're disappointed, honey, my mom adds. I understand how important football is to you. How can I explain it to them? Sure, I'd love to play, but what really bugs me is that football is my biggest connection to my old life. I don't think I've had a single conversation with Dad that wasn't about either my past gridiron glories or the ones he still expects me to have. And since the incident with Joey, the only Hurricanes who will talk to me are Aaron and Bear. Even with them, half the time I get the impression that their main interest is getting their team captain back. For sure, those guys are never going to forgive me for A, doing my community service, which I don't have to, and B, not hating it enough. To be honest, I don't hate it at all. One thing no one ever tells you when you're laid up, like I was in the hospital, is how boring it is. You really appreciate anybody who comes to break the monotony. So I get to be that person for the residents of Portland Street. It makes me feel good about myself. And that's huge at a time when I'm learning I have so much to feel bad about. Besides, I get stuff out of it too. I've learned to play Mahjong, and I've picked up a lot of great tips on how to grow stuff, mostly from Mrs. Kittredge, whose room looks like a botanical garden. I think I'm going to be able to save a lot of Mom's plants, and maybe even the ficus in Helene's room, the one she bought at her preschool's flower sale and is at least 98% dead. That'll make points with Corinne, who is losing her enthusiasm for the fallen leaves and the tiny white bugs that are all over them. As for Mr. Solway, 
despite the fact I've forgotten most of what happened to me. I feel confident saying he's the coolest person I've ever met. Anyone who could jump onto a moving enemy tank, throw open the hatch, and take it out with a grenade has to be a pretty amazing guy. Mr. Solway doesn't see it that way. That's what I did, not who I am. If I'd bothered to think about it, I wouldn't have done it. I'm not that stupid. The sad part is that Mr. Solway can't find his Medal of Honor. Nurse Duncan thinks it probably got misplaced during the Portland Street's big repainting project, and it'll turn up sooner or later. But he's convinced he flat out lost it. I haven't been as sharp since my wife died, he tells me. We never had kids, so we were the whole world to each other. She looked after everything, and I looked after her. He sighs. You can see which one of us did a better job. When she was gone, that's when my life pretty much ended. This? A sweep of his arm takes in the room. It is marking time. I hate it when he talks like that. Come on, Mr. Solway. You've got a good life here. Plenty of friends. He glares at me. Have you ever asked me around this place? Have you ever asked about me around this place? Old ladies on crutches do the hundred yard dash when they see me coming. I've got my own personal table for one in the dining room. The nurses all call me Mr. Happy Face. They think I don't know, because they assume I'm just as deaf as everyone else in this funny farm. I'm getting the sense that, before my accident, I was kind of Mr. Happy Face at my school, I confide to him. I could have told you that, he replies. When you first showed up here, you were just like those other two good-for-nothings. Maybe the worst of the three. Sometimes a whack on the head is exactly what a fellow needs. That's a pretty harsh thing to say to someone with amnesia. But that's just the way Mr. Solway is. He isn't being mean, he's being honest. He's lived a long time and has been through a lot. And he doesn't feel like he has to pull any punches. I respect that more than anything. That whack on the head cost me 13 and a half years of my life, I remind him. Remembering is overrated, he assures me. You know that heroic act that earned me that fancy medal? I don't remember one second of it. The only reason I know what happened is from the report my captain filed with headquarters. I guess when you get older, it's hard to hang on to every detail, I offer. He shakes his head. It is an old age. It's looking into a T-34 tank after a grenade's gone off inside it. Not a pretty sight. That was a medic's explanation anyway. You block out what you can't face. They were the enemy, I say gently. There was a war on. They're always the enemy when they're shooting at you, kid. But a dead man doesn't care what uniform he's wearing. I'm better off forgetting the whole rotten business, metal and all. That's another thing I have in common with Mr. Solway. We're memory loss buddies. I wonder if I blocked out what a jerk I used to be because I can't face it. I don't think it's the same thing, though. Besides, my lost past has started to come back. I wouldn't exactly call it a tsunami of recollection. More like water torture where the blindfolded prisoner feels a drip on his head just off enough to drive him crazy anticipating the next one. I can't even be sure they're real memories. Blowing out candles at what could have been one of my birthday parties. A view of the Hollywood sign that might have come from a family trip to California. Being crushed under a dog pile of football players. A flashback to one of my sports triumphs? Who could tell? My mind plays tricks on me. Last night I had a dream about cherry bombs going off inside the piano, scaring some poor kid half to death. I woke up in a cold sweat. But when I checked the school yearbook for a picture of Joel Weber, he wasn't the guy in my dream. That was no memory, just the product of a guilty conscience. My theory is my brain events fake memories of things I heard about, because I'm trying so hard to remember stuff. I even had a nightmare from the Korean War, and for sure I was never there. I actually saw myself in uniform, climbing up the side of a tank like Mr. Solway did. I yank open the hatch, pull the pin on my grenade, but when the soldiers inside look up at me, I can't bring myself to drop it in on them. I just hang there not knowing what to do, until the grenade goes off in my hand. Believe it or not, the impression from before my accident that seems the most vivid is that little girl. Sometimes so much that I feel like I should be able to reach out and touch the white lace on her blue dress or the red ribbon in her hair. I have to question whether she's any more real than the dreams. She never moves. She just stands there, not looking at me, but off to the side somewhere. She must be important, though. She's the one image that was still with me when I woke up in the hospital. I wonder who she is. School triggers a few memories, too. 
but they're mostly random images and feelings of deja vu. There's nothing solid enough to be useful. I still don't really know who the faculty is, the kids, or the custodians. I'm just now learning my way around a building I've been attending since the sixth grade. I obviously don't remember what a lousy student I was, because my teachers are all so impressed with how well I'm doing now. Some of them seem like they're ready to faint when I actually hand in a homework assignment. Video Club is the one place that's brand new to me, because it actually is. We've collected a ton of footage, footage for the yearbook. I'm lagging behind the other members, since most kids run a mile when they see me coming. I always shout, Brendan sent me! So they know I'm not looking for trouble. Ms. Delia wants me to work on my interviewing skills. Because my subjects seem so ill at ease. Yeah, no kidding. They're all waiting for me to pull up their underwear up over their heads and stuff them into the nearest locker. At least the video kids are getting used to having me around. Except Shoshana, who hates me for good and always. I can't blame her even though I have no memory of what Aaron Bear and I did to her brother. It's pretty strange to be despised for something that, in your mind, never happened, and to someone who seems like you never met. She stopped fighting with me directly. Mostly she makes pointed comments about how the club should have closed up membership while they still had a chance. That's unfair because I'm not even the last to join. Kimmy got here after me, and if I'm a newbie, I don't know what you call her. She doesn't know a camera from a kumquat. For her interview with the haired cheerleader, she left the lens cap on, so there was audio, no video. On her second try, she zoomed in so close that all you could see was a mouth talking. I think Brendan has a kind of crush on Kimmy, because he won't hear anything bad about her. Shooting a mouth, but no face, is expressionism, and lens caps are too analog for the digital age. Whatever. Brendan's true love, though, is YouTube. This afternoon, he shows us his latest clip of a tiny goldfish bravely swimming against the pull of a bathtub drain, while electric guitars roar in the background. Just as a struggling key creature is about to be sucked away to his doom, a toilet plunger slams down over the drain opening, saving his life. Brendan pauses the video to scattered applause. I call it Plunger Ex Machina, he announces grandly. Shoshana doesn't approve. You're wasting your time with this stuff. You should be helping with my entry for the National Video Journalism Contest. It would be a big boost for the club if we win. He brushes her off. The kind of internet traffic I'm trying to generate isn't going to come from some senior citizen reminiscing about the good old days. That depends who we pick, Shoshana insists. Seniors have lived through amazing times and accomplished incredible things. We just have to find the perfect subject. Before I realize who I'm talking to, I blurt, you should talk to Mr. Solway over at Portland Street. Her angry eyes skewer me. I've contaminated her precious project with the sound of my voice. Another of my crimes against humanity, like bullying her brother and not dying when I fell off the roof. Who's Mr. Solway? Kimmy asks. A hero from the Korean War. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. That's the highest award any soldier can get. And how would you know someone like that? Shoshana demands. It's obvious she doesn't believe a word out of my mouth. I work there. Aaron Burr and me. It's our community service for... My voice trails off. She, of all people, knows exactly what we're doing community service for. He sounds perfect, Brendan agrees. Maybe I can get him to ride a tricycle to the car wash, Shoshana retorts icily. At least talk to the guy, Hugo prods. Ms. DeLeo wades in to play peacemaker. I know you'll find a way to make the school proud, she says to Shoshana. And thank you, Chase, for a marvelous suggestion. Shoshana's cheeks darken through pink and red to full crimson. I hope I never hate anybody as much as that girl hates me.